We remember that the Lord Jesus, the, in the week before his betrayal and crucifixion and rejection, was hailed by the people who thought he was coming as a human king, who was going to overthrow the Roman occupiers, was going to set up a, a, a kingdom there in Jerusalem. But of course, in less than a week, the same people who were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, were shouting away with him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. But as we remember this, we remember that as he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He did not fail. He came to accomplish God's plan. Our redemption. And, and although we think of Easter, we think of Good Friday as being the greatest miscarriage of justice in history. Yet we know it was according to God's eternal purpose and plan. And the saviour, the one who came, rejected by man, and rejected by the most men today and most people today, is the living, reigning, exalted Lord. Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, <coughs> Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come. And every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls all round, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them, for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. But you, dress yourself for works. Arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, be, I behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls, against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Thanks be to God. I've had my thoughts directed to Jeremiah for some little while. And as far as I can recall, I've only once preached from Jeremiah, and that was a chapter I was reminded of earlier today when we were 
ministry in Tenerife. And that was on the section where Barak the um, scribe had gone with the word of God from Jeremiah. Jeremiah wasn't free and wasn't able to. And he went and presented this to the king who was in his winter palace. And he had a fire burning by him. And as the words of the scroll, the words of God, a warning of him of his judgment and so on were read, then he, he got a pair of scissors in effect or a knife and he cut them off and he threw the word of God away. It was burned and, and fully rejected. But we live in times, of course, when we so easily can become despondent. We can so easily be tempted to think things are getting bad They've never been this bad in terms of the lack of godliness, the lack of even recognition of God and recognition of his word, the Bible, and the recognition of his son. That's in society generally. But sadly, it's in so much of the professing church. I have the privilege of preaching, as you know, across virtually all the major denominations, and many of the churches I, I, the door's been opened to are not evangelical. And the tragic thing is that so many of the church leaders, and therefore what a lot of the people are hearing week by week, contradict scripture. It's a social gospel. Or it's a gospel that says you can go to God any way you like. You can almost choose your own God. Christ isn't unique. It doesn't matter which way you go. All religions are going up a mountain it's the same mountain, you've just got a different route, we're all going to meet at the top. And it's tempting to think that this land, and this land singularly blessed, we look at the history, we look at the 19th century great missionary explosion, when missionaries went out around the, um, uh, 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 around the world and took the gospel, and churches were planted and it's sad to go around now and to drive around and to just see how many of those buildings that were erected during the 17th, 18th, 19th century in particular have lost their recognition as places of worship. They're turned into houses, they're turned into offices, they're turned into amusement places or anything, anything other than their original purpose. But one big danger we have is to look at the situation around and to think things have never been so bad. It's when we look at scripture, we realise that God has given us his word to tell us and to remind us that history repeats itself and that things have been bad. And in fact, Jeremiah, one of the longer, I mean, we think of him as a major prophet, simply because his book is so long. It's one of the longer ones, 52 chapters. But he lived in a time of great, great apostasy. A time when God had, the, the kingdom had been divided. The original Israel had been divided. Israel, the northern kingdom, had been totally destroyed by the Assyrians. It ceased to exist. And a hundred years before Jeremiah, approximately, Isaiah and other prophets had gone to the kingdom and to Israel and warned them and said, you're turning against God. Israel, the, the northern kingdom, didn't have one single king who we read of did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Not one good king. And God did what he said he would do, and he judged them, and in effect wiped them out. But in the southern kingdom, Judah, a kingdom which saw what had happened and God sent various prophets and Jeremiah particularly because he had a long reign. I say long reign, a long ministry. He ministered for 42 years or so. This covered the reigns of five kings. The first was Josiah. Josiah we think of as one of the good kings of Judah. There were a handful of good kings in the southern kingdom. For example, Josiah and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah. But nevertheless, the general trend was down. 
And Josiah, under him, there was a reformation, a turning back to, to God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. But it proved to be superficial. In fact, a prophetess called Hulda came and said that it would only be short term, and so it proved to be. After him, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin or Kin, Hin and Kin. Very confusing. And finally, Zedekiah, who then was a vacillating puppet king. But these four successive kings led the southern kingdom further and further away into idolatry, into compromise after false gods. And Jeremiah's calling was to prophesy, was to speak from God into that situation. A message of judgment, a message of warning that they had to turn back to God. They had to repent and turn back to God. Otherwise, what would happen, happen to the northern kingdom would happen to them. And poor Jeremiah, it's hard to think of a single convert that he had during his 42 years. We think of him as the weeping prophet, a prophet who his heart was broken. A prophet on a time, and if you read through the book, Jeremiah's not the easiest book to read because it doesn't read chronologically. If you try and read it chapter after chapter and assume that the things that happened happened in chronological order, you'll get confused because it doesn't. But the principle is there were times when Jeremiah cried out and he almost said, Lord, why did you call me? Why have you given me this message? I don't want to do it. I can't do it anymore. And he said when he did, it was like fire in his very, very insides. He couldn't keep it in. God had called him. God had given him this message. And he did it. Over in Revelation, we were studying this in our Greek exposition class I go to the other, the other um, week. And I was very struck by this. And it's in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. And it's making, talking about, of course, the end of times when the Lord returns. They, these are the nations, those who follow the, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Those who rise up and have risen up against the Lord. We find that they will make law, war on the Lamb, verse 14. And the Lamb, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, will conquer them. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. But this is the phrase. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Called, chosen and faithful. You see, the church, and I'm going to call Israel the people of God in the Old Testament, the nation of Judah as it, as it was, the southern kingdom that was left, they were very much like today's church, superficial and shallow, and basically consumed with self-fulfillment, self-gratification. And God warns. The warning of the scriptures is always, see what's gone before. It's said that we don't learn. History repeats itself because people never learn the lessons of history. And so much of the Old Testament, you find it in the Psalms, that the Lord turns his people back to what's happened before. Learn the lessons. Notably, of course, what happened so often in the wilderness, that the people of God, what did they do? They rejected God. They turned against his leader, Moses. They turned against God. They complained. And they, they were judged. But... So many people seem to write off the Old Testament and think it's not relevant. The whole of Scripture is God's word. God breathed, 2 Corinthians 3. And it is God's word. God has spoken. And we read in um, the, the, the New Testament to remind us of this, particularly in Romans 14, verse 6, we find that Fifteen verse four, sorry. Help if I looked at the right chapter. These whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Why? What's the context? 
We are to not worry about persecution, about attack and so on. But rather, we are to stay fast. Learn the lessons of history, basically. The history of God's people. Because the whole scripture is one continuum. The whole of the Old Testament is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking forward to him in anticipation of his coming. And of course, if, if you like, the Old Testament is the type, the shadow. The New Testament, when Christ appeared, is the antitype, the substance. The New Testament looks forward, the Old Testament looks forward to the New Testament. The New Testament explains the Old Testament. If you take one without the other, you get a lopsided understanding of history. And history, of course, is all his story. What Christ is doing, what he came to do. And what he's continuing to do. And what, of course, he will do at his return. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have a lengthy session, um, section. I want, don't want you to be unaware, brothers. And he goes on, he talks about our fathers. He says, they came out of Egypt, in effect. He says, they were baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The context here is the people of God. We look at our nation today. We look at our world today. It's the people of God, and so the professing people of God, and the leaders of the people of God, church leaders, who have turned against the, uh, major, uh, the, the fundamentals. They've turned against their confessions of faith. The major denominations have ditched their foundational statements. The Church of England, the 39 Articles, solid biblical truth. The Congregationals and Presbyterians, the Westminster Confession of Faith, solid, conservative, evangelical truth. It's the same with the Baptists. You look at all the major Protestant denominations, they were founded on the word of God. And now they have rejected that. We're right for God's judgment. And Paul goes on to say there, in verse 6 there. Now these things, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And then he goes on a list of the things that happened. These things, verse 11, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, lest anyone who, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to learn the lessons of Scripture. And we need to learn and take heed of the lessons of the Old Testament. Not put them in little boxes and say, well, it doesn't apply to us. The principles do. Many of us have loved the ministry of the late Martin Lloyd-Jones. And one thing he said over and over again was, the church Christians need to learn the lessons of history. Church history. Look back through the previous generations. Look back through previous centuries. And you'll realise there have been times like today of declension and turning away. And God's people humbled themselves and were turned to their, put to their knees, turned back to the scriptures. And they prayed and the Lord raised up. Think of uh, late leaders. Think particularly of the late 18th or the second half of the 18th century. A time when in this land things were terrible. And we remember the Great Awakening on the other side of the Atlantic with Jonathan Edwards in this country with the Wesleys and Whitfield and others. Coming back to Jeremiah then here, let's just want to look at a few of the things that we're told about him. We're told that in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, I called you. Here's the call, the beginning of verse 4. The word of the Lord came to him. 
I said Jeremiah had a long ministry, maybe seven, uh, 42 years or so. People often think of him as being young. It seems most likely that he was about 30. 30, of course, is a key age in Scripture. The Lord Jesus began his earthly ministry at the age of 30. Rabbis were constituted, recognised as rabbis from the age of 30. Priests began at the age of 30. Timothy, as a young man, was probably in his 30s. But that's relatively young. And at the time, a youth, a young man, could be anybody up to and including in his 30s. But nevertheless, it's significant. The word of the Lord came to him. He had a call. And brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian today, if you know and are trusting in the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you've had a call from God. It's not accidental. It's not just random circumstances. Because God is God. God is sovereign. And the word of the Lord in this terrible time came to Jeremiah. We're told his father was a priest. We're not told too much about him. As I said, it came in the time of Josiah when there was a bit of a reformation in, in the kingdom. Nevertheless, the Lord chose him. And we're going to see Jeremiah, like as so often, was reluctant there are similarities here when we read Jeremiah and the call of Jeremiah to that of Moses. Moses at the burning bush, remember, he was brought up in Pharaoh's household. And then for, uh, at the age of 40, he had to flee from his life when he stood up for the people of God and their mistreatment and abuse and persecution of slaves in Egypt. And after 40 years as a shepherd... And nobody, God met him. The Lord Jesus met him in the burning bush. And the call came and the commission. And as it did here to Jeremiah. But notice what we see there. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Could spend a lot of time on the word knew there. It's not just I knew about you. When you see new in the Old Testament or knowing or in the New Testament, it's knowing in a sense of relationship, in a sense of dealing with. I knew you in the way that Genesis 4 verse 1 tells them, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. He didn't just know about her. It meant there was an intimate relationship there. At the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when in that day of judgment, Jesus says many will say to me Lord didn't we do this we, did, we, we prophesied we taught and preached in your name we cast out miracles we did mighty works and Jesus will say depart from me you evil doers I never knew you he's not saying I wasn't aware of what you were there and what you were doing you don't belong to me I didn't have a relationship with you and I love Galatians chapter 1 when Paul it's his angry epistle <clears throat> angry that churches he'd taken the gospel to had gone off following another gospel, even if there had been. And he says in verse 15, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was, free, was, was pleased to reveal his son, if your version, as many do, as mine do here, says his son to me, that's a mistranslation. In the Greek, reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And he goes on. But you see what Paul's saying. Paul recognised God set him apart before he was born. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ tonight, you didn't in one sense become a Christian the day that you recognised and uh, your sin and came to the cross, came to the Lord Jesus and asked for salvation. There's a sense in which your salvation, your redemption began in eternity past. God chose us before the foundation of the world. You see, God's outside of time, God's spirit. And the work that God begins, he will complete. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, a favourite work. Paul, uh, verse, Paul says, writing to these Philippian believers, he says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When did he begin it? In eternity past. When will he bring it to completion? 
eternity, future. There's no beginning, there's no end with God. And so here you've got this relatively young man. We don't hear and know anything about him before. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I set my love upon you. I chose you for a purpose. Of course, I guess the best known verses that pick this up are in Romans chapter 8. You have the golden chain there. That well-known golden chain in Romans 8 where Paul Paul, Paul says that having spoken about the suffering in the world, us groaning for our redemption and so on, then he goes on and he says, for we know, verse 28, that for all those who love God, all things work together, or God works all things together for those who love him. For those who are the called according to his purpose, and this is the golden chain, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that they might be the firstborn, he might be the firstborn among among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he knew, he chose, he set his love upon, he predestined them, he foreknew them, he predestined them. He also called. When's the call? When the call comes in time. Predestination, God choosing, comes in eternity past. The call comes through the gospel. If you're in Christ today, wherever you are in this build, from in this building, or those of you who are watching this, or will be watching this, wherever you are in the world, God set his love upon you. And before the foundation of the world, he chose you. Not because there was any good in you, not because of anything he knew or thought you might do, but just because he chose to put his, set his love on you. And he called you in time through the gospel. And... Those whom he called, of course, it doesn't just stop there. He also justified, declared not guilty. And those he justified, he also glorified. God, Jeremiah, Paul, Moses, you, we were called because we were chosen. And so God says to Jeremiah, he says, I did it all. I, before I formed you, I had this relationship with you. I chose you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. What's Jeremiah's reaction? Do you think he got all excited and said, wow, I'm going to be a great, I'm going to be a great leader. I'm going to be a great prophet. Totally the opposite. Our Lord God. To remind you of Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah 100 years or so earlier. Woe is me. There's trembling. There's a genuine fear. Who am I? You can't. Sure, God, you've got it wrong. You can't be using me. Do you sometimes feel like that? Do you sometimes feel hopeless in the, in the face of what's happening in the world? What's happening in the professing church? We're a relatively small group here tonight. Do you not feel, where are we going? Has God forgotten us? No, he says, I called you, I appointed you. And it's first, he's our Lord God is a kind of, no, surely not, this can't be. Because he says, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to speak. You see, you've got God's calling and three senses of it that come out here. First of all, you've got God's preparation. God's predestination. And secondly, you have God's provision. And see what God says to him. Here's Jeremiah, a bit like Moses. Remember Moses said, Lord, I can't go to Pharaoh. And I can't speak. What am I going to say? The Lord got angry with Moses, didn't he almost? He says, Moses, I made your mouth. Don't you think I can put my words in it? And it's exactly what you've got here with Jeremiah. If God calls you whatever ministry he calls you to or for, and I mean ministry in the wider sense, not just preaching formally, but whatever he calls you for, he will equip you. He will provide for you. He will give you the very words. And he says, look, he says, Jeremiah says, I don't know how to speak for I'm only a youth. The Lord said to me, don't say I'm only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. And, and this is key, whatsoever I command you, you shall speak. 
Down at the end of verse 9, he says, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. And you get this all the way down. You get it in 17. Say to them everything I command you. You see, the only authority any of us have as God's people in witnessing, whether that's formally from a pulpit, whether that's in his evangelist, as a missionary, as a minister, as a Bible teacher, or whether that's just witnessing to your next door neighbours or people at work or people who the Lord brings across your path. The only authority we have is this book, is God's word. To speak his good word, not to compromise on it, not to adulterate it, not to water it down, not to try and miss out the difficult bits so that we don't offend people. But whatsoever I command you, says to, uh, said God, and he says, I put my words in your mouth. You get the same thing with Moses. You get it with Ezekiel. You get it as you look through. The word of the Lord came to the prophets. The word of the Lord came. They spoke just what God said. You see, Jeremiah had a divine mission. And he had a direct message. No right to do anything about it or to alter it. And... Thirdly, protection. You see, you can understand Jeremiah. He could see what had happened to previous prophets. He knew what was likely to happen to him. Reminds me of the Apostle Paul. We like to think of Paul as being bold and strong and having huge success in ministry and so on. But Paul knew his weakness when he went to Corinth, Acts 18. We read one stage. The Lord saying to him, don't be afraid, for I have many people in this city. Paul had been on his first missionary journey. He'd been flooded, imprisoned, he'd been chased out of cities. He'd been stoned and left for dead on his second missionary journey. The, in, in Philippi, he'd been thrown into prison and, um, and, and flogged and so on. In Thessalonica, the Jews had ri- ri- risen up and chased him out. In Berea, the same thing happened. He'd gone to Athens and had limited... Um, reception and success he went to Corinth and you can imagine Paul was human when Paul went to a new city he didn't check out the hotels where he was going to stay he'd check out the prisons because he knew that's where he was likely to end up and you can imagine Paul thinking Lord you've called me now I've got to preach your word but it's going to be more floggings it's going to be more suffering it's going to be more rejection and the Lord says keep speaking I have many people. I, you just be faithful. You just witness. I will give the fruit. I will do the work. It's always the way. And so the Lord says to Jeremiah here, he says, he, he, he said, do not be afraid of them, verse 8. I will be with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. You get the same thing with Moses at the end of Deuteronomy and Joshua, of course, in, Je- in Joshua chapter 1. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. I am with you. You see, to know that God's put his hand on you, he's prepared you. To know, therefore, that he provides for you. He's given us his word. I'll put my word in your mouth. And to know that we've got his protection. And fourthly, the fourth P, predestination or preparation, provision, protection, and fourthly, power. Verse 10, see, I've set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow and to build and to plant. Just drop down, time's going, but drop down to verse 15. Behold, I'm calling all the tribes of the kingdom of the north, declares the the, the Lord. He's, He's saying, look, they're coming around here. They're coming to judge this nation because this nation's rejected me. Because this nation has rejected my word, my government. Isn't that just like our land today? Isn't this just like our land and so much of the world that's had the gospel? It's rejected. We seem to be, I nearly said hell-bent, and actually in a literal sense for so many, it is hell-bent. On rewriting history, that taking the name of Christ, taking Christianity, taking the Bible, taking the Ten Commandments, taking what God says taking righteousness out of society completely 
and doing the opposite. God in the past judged his people and judged the nations who did that to turn them back to himself. And here he says it's a verse of... You see, Jeremiah's message was not acceptable. It wasn't going to make him popular. He suffered. He's known as the weeping, weeping prophet. He suffered rejection. As I say, we don't know uh, 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 of converts he had. It seems his message seemed, humanly speaking, a waste of time. But God's word never is. And millions since have read and we're hearing and reading his words, the words God spoke through him tonight. Don't just look at what appears to be on the surface. We do not know what God's going to do with your witness, your testimony to somebody. Maybe we won't see it in our lifetime. No, says, um, says the Lord to Jeremiah. You've got my preparation. You've got my provision. You've got my protection. And you've got my power. Verse 18 I'll make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. Why? For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Brothers and sisters, if you take nothing from this, know this. That if you're a true child of God, then the Lord is with you. And you may feel you're in a hard place. You may feel that you're a minority. You may be feeling weary, despondent, tempted by the evil one to give up, to quit, or at least to soften your witness, your testimony, your life, to go with the flow, to not offend the world and not be offended by it. To, run, to go out of the fight, we're called to be soldiers in an alien land. We're called to run the race as an athlete who, despite weakness, despite weariness, has his eye on only the goal. And we're called like farmers to go on waiting for the harvest because the harvest will come. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's very easy in so many little churches to think, where is the future? Where, where, where are we going? We need to remember always that this church is not a human institution. The church, and I mean the church of Jesus Christ, doesn't belong to any man, it belongs to him. And he said, I, not I will try to, or I may, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it.